Welcome to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our websites are catholicism.org and reconquest.net. My email address is bam at catholicism.org. That's bam at catholicism.org. You can send me a short email with a question, comment, or suggestion. You can find me on social media, on, on the Twitter, at Brother underscore Andre, and you can find me easily on Facebook. Just search for Brother Andre Marie, and you will find me. This evening's episode is episode number 217, and we're calling it The Mass is a True Sacrifice. And my guest is Ryan Grant, the founder and president of Mediatrix Press, a Latinist and translator of the works of St. Robert Bellarmine who just recently came out with the work of St. Robert Bellarmine on the Most Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And this is the book, at least the first half of which, will provide us with questions to to have our discussion in this show. Um, we're going to speak, as the name suggests, of the Mass as a true sacrifice in the strict and proper sense of that word as it's used in the Bible for uh, sacrifices. And not just in some wide sense, like when you are told by your mother to do something and you don't want to, and she says, offer it up. Okay, <laughs> that's a sacrifice, but not like the holy sacrifice of the mass. And frankly, not even like the, um, the, the official liturgical public worship sacrifices of the Old Testament. So um, to discuss that and more, uh, we bring Ryan Grant, founder and president of Mediatrix Press. Good evening, Ryan. How are you? Good evening, brother. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, and thank you for being had. <laughs> Appreciate it very much. <laughs> um, I know that it's t taking a dent out of your, your own day. And in real time, we're recording on Valentine's Day, so I hope that I haven't done anything um, to, uh, you know, um, upset the Grant household to have you take take time out on St. Valentine's Day. No, not at all. It's... Uh... Just another work day, really. Just another so, work day. Just our, another our, priest our and martyr. Our anniversary is on the fifth of okay. February, so we usually roll celebrations into that into that day, and then because of the usually very trendy commercial things, we just don't really care for, so we don't typically go out for them. All right. Well, good. That that's good. You're you're not worldly. That's a good thing. <laughs> now, um, all right. So, the the um, the book begins uh, after your um, introduction, your translator's introduction. The book begins by Saint Robert Bellarmine asking a question about the mass. What does the word mass mean? And he addresses that. And I know he gives. He gives a lot of kind of esoteric, well, what would strike, I think, most modern readers as esoteric um, explanations of the origin or the etymology of the word mass, some of them coming from various Hebrew words, all of which he dismisses. Uh, but then he goes on to give the actual explanation of what the word mass means. And because I think this is not sufficiently known among Catholics, um, could you talk, could you speak to this? In other words, cut to the chase of what St. Robert Bellarmine says it actually means? Right. Well, um, I should mention the Hebrew argument just briefly, only because uh, that there was an article I saw recently where somebody was trying to make that case based on certain authors. And so cutting through all of that longer etymology, St. Robert Bellarmine rejects the notion that the word comes from Hebrew, the Hebrew word misak, because of the fact that it is in a in, in all the liturgies, the East and the West, whether the language is Greek or Aramaic or Latin, <clears throat> the fact is that any word that came from Hebrew is common to all of those liturgies. Yep. So when you think of it, even in the traditional Latin Mass, you know, Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus, Sabaoth. Sabaoth is, yeah. Sabaoth is uh, translates into Latin as exercitum in the genitive plural, uh, you know, armies, so the god of armies. But it's retained in the liturgy, along with a good number of other Hebrew words that are found there, Hosanna and Amen and, and such. And those are common in all the liturgies, irrespective of their language. So why, if that was so, and, you know, why is it Justin Martyr and Irenaeus don't know anything about, anything about this word Misak? Or, or, or why, or, again, or, or the, the modern not call their liturgy the Mass? Yeah, or the modern and, Maronites either, because the, 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 yeah. the Maronites who use a Semitic language, Syriac, don't use that word. No. So, therefore, he moves from that, 
And he covers a good number of opinions, but ultimately he <clears throat> comes down to that the most probable opinion is that the mass comes from the word missio, or the dismissal of the people. So that missa is the same as missio, just as among the ancients collecta forms from collectio, right? And the Greeks have a similar kind of contraction of the word from a third declension noun, like missio, to a first declension, misa. And there's reference made to that in earlier writers, um, Amalarius, who's an 8th century, Alcuin, who's about the same time. You know, they, they make reference to this particular thing, too. So we, But at the same time, the word kind of is used in different ways. So like most people, if you look at a 1962 missile and you open it up, it'll have on the one hand, in the very beginning, it'll say the mass of the catechumens. Mm -hmm. And then the latter part will say the mass of the faithful. So a lot of people say, well, wait, wait a minute, well, why do we have the, is this two masses? Why are, why are they called different masses? Yeah, yeah. And it's ultimately because that ancient distinction in the Roman Rite is drawn from, you know, describing the misa, the dismissal of the catechumens, which would take place after the creed. So that because only the fidelis, the, the fidelium, the faithful, for the misa fidelium, the, the, the fidelis are the only ones who are properly capax, as it were, in the in the ancient custom and the ancient traditions of the church, to be present at the you know the the sacred uh, you know that that part of the mass which has the 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 offering and the um, and after the offertory the holy consecration. I just trying to search my word for the the Greek words for these, but the nevertheless. Well, the the, the Greek the Greeks the Greek speak of the anaphora, what we call the canon, right. they call the anaphora, right? Right. And so they couldn't be present for that. Right. And so that's that's where, you know, Bellerman begins in, you know, laying out various distinctions on the use of the word mass, at least in the in the West. And so, so the first so for the, for the non the, for the not Ryan, excuse me, for the non Latinists out there, the word mito mitere means to dismiss, right? So right. We, to send, to we, dismiss, to send away, there's different ways to render it. And so it's that that last uh, so the participle ends up as misa. Mm -hmm. And it can also be taken from there into a noun. And it's that form that, that basically Misa contracts from Misio, which is a third declension now, which means the same thing, that dismissing. So that and this is done in the early church for simplification. So, you know, Misa, basically, it shows up at the end. Go, it, it, essentially, according to Amelarius, who's, a, again, 8th century writer, he says, go, it is the dismissal. And that's also what, um, even as recently as Adrian Fortescue follows up. Okay. Now the 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 uh, in the Ukraine, so there are two dismissals. I mean, so there was the dismissal of the catechumens, right? That happened right. before the the anaphora or before the the canon. And um, we we in the Ukrainian rites or in the Eastern rites, they still have the dismissal. They'll say catechumens depart. They they boot them out officially still. Right. Um, okay. So in other words, it comes from. But 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 why would then would the mass be named after the end of it or the dismissal? Okay. Now we're kicking you out. So we're going to name the thing the kicking out. Right. What? Why would that be? <laughs> <laughs> well, essentially, um, the when you look at it, it's first of all it's seen in ancient authors such as Ambrose and a few others. They actually use the term misa in Latin to refer to carrying out the sacrifice of the mass. Uh huh. Um, and that's your, your first thing. Then the second thing is that, um, you know, that, that when the, it, what, what Bellerman says about it, whether that sacred action in which the Eucharist is convected with many prayers and ceremonies preceding and following, you know, is that a sacrifice? <clears throat> and so we do not understand in this place whether it's an individual right, it pertains to the essence of the sacrifice, but only whether among those rites there is something which should properly be called a sacrifice to which all the rest refer. So when he goes then further through that articles, um, through that article, because the word itself was taken and understood in, you know, the preparation for, that's the last thing you get before the, you know, the, cat, the mess of the catechumens. Essentially, when you roll into the mass of the faithful, Right, you know, is that uh, the term is used there because essentially, really, just the proximity, and then later customary use. I see. And there's other ways in which misa is understood, where it refers to the divine office, uh, as he cites uh, Saint Leo the Great, Saint Gregory, and others. And they're, they're, when they talk about that, you can think of 
in the Eastern Church the way they use the word liturgia, so that the liturgy itself embraces all the hours and embraces matins, it embraces vespers and, and all the other canonical hours, uh, which are common to East and West, just not in their uh, actual form. Uh-huh. They all they call them all liturgy, and then there's the divine liturgy, which is uh, which is specific what sacrifice. we call the mass. Yeah, yeah. So, so that now some people, I I don't think Saint Robert Bellarmine does this, but some people take the word misa as a dismissal, but then they kind of spiritualize the notion of dismissal. It's not just that you're dismissed from this ceremony now because it's over, because the sacrifice is over, but you're sent, in a sense, like the apostles, or you're sent in, in the sense of going out into the world to sanctify the world. Is that... Uh, Sam Robert Bellman didn't say that, but other authors have, correct? Right. Um, I think so. I've seen that before. And in the history of the liturgy, too, we have to understand that there are certain things that come about in ancient times because they were practical or they served this purpose or that purpose that's not particularly known today or maybe is guessed at, or as in other cases it is known. And then a further significance will be added to it. Mm-hmm. And, and so most of those things Bellarmine is not so much concerned with here unless it's a direct defense against Protestant authors. Okay. But <clears throat> I take, for example, the priest wears a maniple. The maniple was simply a napkin that he wore, being you know being a hot, humid climate, wearing thick vestments, uh, you'd start sweating. And so the maniple was essentially a, a napkin or a handkerchief of sorts that you would use to wipe your forehead when you were sweating profusely during the liturgy. And then it evolved into a vestment, and it's a vestment that also has certain significance attached to it by the sacred writers. Now, all that significance is valid in itself. Yes, yes, you know, yes. To consider, in, in, but it's also not the reason why it was put there. Yeah. And the, the same goes for a handful of other things. For example, I think it was Cardinal Bona, unless I'm mistaken, in his commentary on the liturgy. He's uh, 16th century, or perhaps it was another author. I can't quite recall, but he says that when the priest at the traditional Latin Mass pulls the patent from under the corporal, and he stands it up, yep. right, that this represents Our Lady standing at the foot of the cross, uh-huh. which is okay. a really nice spiritual illusion, but the actual reason was that why that was done is in case any dust had gotten onto it while it was underneath the corporal, that's all being shaken off before Christ, the host is being placed on it. That's what's actually physically going on. Yeah, okay, so so yeah, and, and you, you'll read this in pious books where there's all these explanations of the rituals that were thought of by people long after those rituals were already fixed, codified, right. and okay, so that makes sense. All right, so um, so it's just it's just this practical thing of it, it, the, the word that was commonly attached to various dismissals that took place in the mass uh, attached itself to the mass itself. Okay, interesting. Now, um, so l- let's plow into the actual subject of, of of sacrifice because this is something I think that even a lot of Catholics don't understand, and certainly non Catholics who, who criticize the Mass and 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 who think it's well, who think God knows what about what we think of the Mass, they don't know it. But it's good for Catholics to under to have a grasp of this so that we aren't I- misidentifying what it is that we're doing in in our official uh, Catholic worship. So what is a sacrifice according to St. Robert Bellarmine? Because he, he okay. goes into the definition, I think, in the second chapter. Right. So a sacrifice properly for, for Bellarmine is something where, a, a, for one, um, you have to take a profane matter and make it sacred by some sort of offering. And then furthermore, you take that offering and <clears throat> consecrate it, offer it, dedicate it to God, and then that, that uh, the matter of the thing has to be destroyed in some fashion as a sign of it uh, being a, a, a sacrifice. And so and he gives various um, f- you know, further distinctions for this that uh, in, in, in response to various Protestant notions in the second chapter. So one is, you know, he says, firstly, we say it's an oblation so that we might show the kind of sacrifice. And then the, in this place, we receive a sacrifice for an action of sacrificing, but not for the victim itself, right, which is sacrificed, even though it is also customarily called a sacrifice. So there's a, this distinction of it, the offering of it, or the oblation is a necessary constituent part, <clears throat> but it's not, but it consists in the action, not the actual sacrifice itself. So then secondly, he says, 
you know, he says we say sacrifice is an ex- an outward offering, an external offering. So and, so, and and he says an offering can be twofold, broadly speaking. Um, so it could be invisible, and in, in which is to say internal, or it could be visible, namely external. The reason he makes this distinction is that one of the chief arguments that the Protestants make, specifically John Calvin and Martin Chemnitz, <clears throat> Martin Chemnitz, if you're not familiar with him, his book The Examination of the Council of Trent is even today still a Protestant favorite uh, for uh, huh. attacking Catholic doctrines. So, the, you know, so there they basically lay up that, and we'll, we'll deal with this again later, that, you know, sacrifices that are commanded in the new law are essentially internal. And so Bellarmine's trying to show know that a sacrifice, it has to be outward. Now, there is an internal aspect to it, but principally it's visible because it's, it's part of the public worship of God. So it has to be visible. Uh, you're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. Uh, we're talking about the Mass as a true sacrifice with our guest Ryan Grant, and of course, in the Old Testament, he points out that in the Old Testament, there, 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 there are these distinctions between the internal, you know, the the, the humble and contrite heart, you know, from right. Psalm, Psalm 50, which um, was recently quoted. <laughs> but you, right. you were you were saying it in Latin before we recorded. Um, so there's that, uh, you know, he's he's distinguishing the humble and contrite heart, which is an interior act of virtue, from the outward sacrifices. So there's obviously a distinction there. Exactly. Then uh, <clears throat> the next thing he gives is that it has to be made to God alone. That is, it properly constitutes latria, and it's not duly. You can't offer sacrifices to saints in a proper sense, mm-hmm. right? Because sacrifice as an act of our religion is has to be dedicated to God alone. And he does various things, quoting from various fathers. And so then, then he gives another consideration. Uh, fourthly, he says, for the recognition of human weakness and the profession of the divine majesty. All right, and so he adds in here, this is the general purpose of all sacrifices. For there are, as if they were allotted, those things which are rendered to God in recognition of his supreme lordship and our subjection. And this is also the reason why the action of sacrificing has praise and is, and is a work of virtue. Otherwise, works are different or indifferent such as to kill and burn animals and similar things. But when these are to show that all things proceed from God and must be consumed in his honor, now there are works of religion, and hence good and praiseworthy. So essentially what you know, that all comes to is that the, um, you know, the purpose of professing the divine majesty, it also assists our weakness so that we see this thing has gone on, and we ourselves are giving that as an outward sign. Mm-hmm. Um, because often you need to have an outward thing to, in, in most acts of religion, obviously there's meditation and things that are primarily taking place inwardly, but you need an outward action in order to, you know, help the, basically help the body, help our weakness to understand that uh, we, we are praying, we are worshiping our God, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's why we have all these outward acts. There's an assistant uh, to that. And then he comes to the next consideration by a legitimate minister. So it's not for anyone to offer sacrifice, but a public and certain man who completes it by a common name. In the law of nature, there were priests or heads of households such as Noah, Abraham, and those in whom God inspired it. In the written law, only the sons of Aaron. In the law of grace, only bishops and priests properly ordained, as all the council's fathers and the custom of every church teaches, right? So, and that's important, too, because the Protestants will also make the argument, and you'll see it again uh, when I get uh, complete the translation on the, on the sacrament of order, where he'll address this, this argument more directly. The Protestants, of course, argue that in the New Testament, every, every man is a priest. Every Christian is a priest, right? Yeah. So, and so he's making note that, well, in the Old Testament, at a certain point, that was true, but under the under the law, only the sons of Aaron were obviously the Levites. And then, in the law of grace, only bishops and priests. And this is an important thing for a a true sacrifice 
you know, in the church. So, so it's to, if I can make because I, I, I we're taking it for granted that the audience knows what some of these things mean. When Saint Robert Bellman says the law of nature, and then the written law, and then of course the new law of grace, the 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 law of nature is the the law that prevailed from the time of Adam until Moses, when when the Mosaic law becomes codified. The law of Moses, right. the written law, is from the law of Moses up till our Lord's time when it becomes. Um, uh, dead, and then subsequently after the destruction of the temple, deadly, and then we have the, um, the 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 new law of grace, which is instituted by our Lord Himself. So He's speaking in terms of these three different dispensations of the law, and there are different priesthoods. So under nature, there were various priests. Um, we know that we know that uh, it, Cain and Abel. You know, there was little controversy over their priesthoods, um, their respective priestly offerings. Uh, which ultimately ended up with um, Cain's slaying Abel because Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's wasn't. So there was a different order, as it were, of priesthood. And that's a little less clear to us, but we know from the time of the law of Moses that it was only the the descendants of Aaron among the Levites who could be priests. Right. And now the Protestants have arguments against that too, which we'll see later in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the, it's also worth noting that according to, there are certain things that according to natural law, there is still part of that priesthood that still persists down to us, and namely that there's certain rules that the Father has just in terms of, of leading prayers and other things. So there is a validity to that, again, blessing your children. Yes, yes. Right. Every father has the natural law right to bless his children. Now, the church, on the other hand, has various blessings that it's brought out by its authority and where grace is conferred, but they rest- she, she restricts those to the priests, right? Now, now, that's actually not a matter of divine law. That's actually a matter of fittingness, because it, the, the ability to bless, as we can see with these natural law blessings and other things, and it's also taught in, um, by the theologians, it's not intrinsic to the priesthood itself per se, but the church restricts it there because of its fittingness. Uh-huh. Because if she wanted, they could, they could let any layman do any blessing they wanted, if the church truly wanted to. And some are, to, some are even today. more restricted to bishops, right? So the blessing right. of certain items is restricted only to bishops. That's correct. Or, for example, too, if you were going to fashion a Roman corporal, which uh, has relics into it, it's a, a corporal that has relics put into it so that you could put it anywhere in place of an altar stone. So essentially you could say Mass basically anywhere um, according to the... Uh, the tradition, anyway, because they've got more or less gotten rid of that in the new canon law. But, um, but still, only a bishop can do that. Uh-huh. And, and there's several other items as well that only bishops can can bless. Chrism, the more obvious one, and, and things of that sort. So, and and a lot of that's restricted. That that would be the, the, in terms of the sacramental <clears throat> nature of it. I'd have to review what they say about chrism and things. But in, in the general blessing, like you know, I, I you know. Benedico Vos and Omni Patris, Fili, Spiritu, et cetera, um, or, or, you know, Benedicat Vos, Omni Potens, says, you know, may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, et cetera, the different formulas for it. Uh, we can't say that as laymen uh-huh. because that's restricted to the priest. But we can still, you know, come to our own child and say, Bened- you know, Benedicto Te, et cetera, in, in, in the Trinitarian formula, because by the natural law, right, we can do that, mm-hmm. you know just because of what it is. Whereas the the formal blessings the church has laid down, she says no. Yeah, yeah. Just to get off that point before we get stuck here. And <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> so yeah, and and now but going going back to the notion of of uh, of sacrifice, you're speaking of a of a of a sacerdotal act of a of a uniquely priestly act and it's always been a priestly act. Whether 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 we're talking about the order of nature, the order of uh, the, the written law of Moses, or the order of gra- the, the the law of grace, right. So uh, so what then is what then is a sacrifice? I know he gives a definition of sacrifice right. in the book, um, which is uh, you know he he explains the different aspects. Now actually you 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 gave it and you and you and you somewhat broke it down. But if right. we, and he breaks it down a bit further if you want to continue with it. Yeah. There, there's just a couple more things actually here to, to go over. There, there's a place later in the book where he gives a simpler definition, and it's almost as if he, he, he simplifies it by accident. When, when um, and I'm trying to remember the wording that he uses. But he makes it clear that the thing's destroyed. Right. That it represents the destruction of a thing, and it's not just, it's it's not just an oblation because we can make ourselves an oblation. We mm-hmm. can anything can can be an oblation. I mean, anything good can be an oblation. 
Um, and that's just an offering. Of course, you, right. as, as you know, the, the Latin word oblation offering come from the same word. And, and the, those English words come from the same exact Latin word. But anything can be offered, but that doesn't mean that it's a sacrifice. But for it to be a true sacrifice, there's a, there's a destruction. So if it's a... Right. So he gives a different mm -hmm. Old Testament. Like if it's a living thing, it has to be killed. If it's a mm -hmm. if it's a, if it's a libation, it has to be somehow spilled out or spoiled or ruined somehow. Mm -hmm. If it's food, it has to be consumed or or or, or burned. So um, so there's so there's this aspect of destruction that's in the right. concept of sacrifice. So that way, because there ha a change has to take place, and the change has to be so complete that the, the sensible matter will cease to be what it was. And that's the principle behind it that, that turns this, this offering not to not to being just merely an offering, to make it uh, uh, properly a sacrifice, okay. without which that, that wouldn't be the case. Okay, okay. So, um, so I think, I don't want to get too caught up in, 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 in the notion of sacrifice. I think we've pretty much got it. Um, now, if we can, if now if we can move on, um, how does the concept of sacrifice, as Saint Robert explains it, uh, differ from what would have been the common coinage among Protestants in his day? Okay, so the Protestants in his day would have taken the sacrifice and essentially turned it into something that is internal, or again, something that does not require any kind of offering or destruction, but it would, would signify an offering of the heart, such as uh, psalms, praises, uh, and again, of course, they cite the psalms and the and Proverbs, you know, it, you know, my, my prayer sent to thee like an evening sacrifice in thy sight, etc. And so it you know, all of these sorts of things then, you know, the Protestants put forward as sacrifices, likewise almsgiving. Now, Bellarmine would say, yeah, these are indeed sacrifices improperly speaking. That is, in a certain sense, there is a sacrifice that goes on, but it's not a sacrifice properly speaking. So that's why you'll notice when you go through the book, is that almost every time he it gets redundant after a certain point, but I was loath to change it merely on the city redundancy because he's putting it there for a reason. Um, when he says, you know, as sacrifice, he says sacrifice properly speaking. Yeah, yeah. Because he wants those considerations of what we've just kind of laid down that the sensible matter is offered to God an external right by a public minister, and the thing is com is consumed in such a way that it, it it's it's changed, it's destroyed, it, it no longer ceases to be. Right, as an act of offering and worship to God. So some of the you know, so the things that the Protestants name have some of these characteristics, but not all of them. So some of them certainly have a matter of offering. Some of them certainly have a matter of uh, you know, like a value, and, and, and value is worship to God and such things. But they don't properly constitute a sacrifice for Saint Robert. So that. Um, is really the, the the principal distinction in that you'll see that again and again at almost every turn when St. Robert is is teaching on the Old Testament types, such as Melchizedek and Malachi and other places, the Protestants are again usually arguing those places that a true sacrifice is all about the uh, almsgiving and prayers and things of this sort. And so Bellarmine has to show from these Old Testament types why it's it just doesn't fit. Yeah, actually, and 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 that's one of the things about you know you can say, you can say somebody could respond well ipse dixit you know he himself said it he made up that definition he's cheating you know he's 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 come up with a definition that it just so happens to fit the Catholic concept of sacrifice and that's not honest but actually what he's doing is he's he's engineering this definition from so that it actually describes all of the sacrifices in the strict and proper sense that it were offered in the Old Testament as well as in the New. Exactly. And that's an important point, <clears throat> is that the Old Testament sacrifices are really and truly properly sacrifices. And they have all these characteristics. And so the sacrifice of the New Covenant, likewise, will have these characteristics, which he, he goes on to show. Okay. So, um, so then... Uh, what then is the what then distinguishes? I think you've you've already said it, but let's make it really explicit. What then distinguishes uh, any use of the word sacrifice in the wide sense or in the improper sense from a sacrifice, you know, properly speaking, or a sacrifice in the proper sense of the word? Right, a victim in a sacrificial mat, uh, sacrificial matter. There has to be a sensible object 
which is a victim or itself is just the thing is just destroyed. <clears throat> and it has to be done, again, by the public ministry of the Church for God's worship. So the, um, then the next thing that usually will come up is that the next uh, bit for the Protestants is to show, well, what if the cross was the sacrifice, and the true cross of Christ, that was a true sacrifice, but this this mass thing you guys got going here, that's that's not a sacrifice. In fact, in, and they usually say it's injurious to Christ's sacrifice. It's injurious to what he commanded on the Last Supper. It makes this whole man-made, you know, fabrication. It takes its place, right? So that's what, you know, they tend to argue uh, going through it even back then. It's not a new thing. So, so Bellarmine then goes to show that, well, first he has to deal with the, the sacrifice of the cross, that the sacrifice of the cross is a true sacrifice and you know then there's several ways and so it's a true sacrifice it truly offers you know self god you know in obedience to god offered his life for the sins of the world and it, you know, to, to obtain mercy so then bellarmine fields an objection there well if that's so well maybe the passions of the martyrs are also called sacrifices and so in, in making the distinction then he goes on to further illustrate w why that Christ's sacrifice on the cross is a true sacrifice. And so uh, to, to summarize those, he says that, you know, broadly speaking, imp you know, properly, just like good works, you could say that the, uh, the passions of the martyrs are a certain form of sacrifice, but they're not properly a sacrifice. And there's four different reasons. So the first he gives is the concept of the person. Christ is truly and properly a priest. As it says in the Old Testament, you are a priest forever. And he was a great, and he was the greatest priest, so who could offer any sacrifice whatsoever, and so even his own body. And the holy martyr, martyrs also, some of them are not priests, and even the ones who were were not those who could choose, you know, the victim prescribed in law, right? So they can't just decide they're going to be, the, you know, the victim of some sacrifice. Next, the act itself, Christ properly sacrificed himself since it was in his power to die and not to die. And he cites various scriptures, especially John 10, 18. I offer myself as a sacrifice. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I laid down my life that, uh, that I, might not, I might take it up again. No man takes it from me, which Bellarmine's gloss is that, you know, I, basically this means I offer myself as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So then uh, the form, Christ is truly sanctified in a mystic rite. It didn't happen by chance, but by his by by election, uh, so that on the day of the Paschal feast and on the altar of the cross, while extending his hands, he suffered outside the gate of the city. Right, it's what Saint Leo the Great notes. And and the uh, and the outside the gate, of course, is a reference to Hebrews, where Saint Paul yes. is sort of exegeting the the crucifix uh, account uh, in in keeping with the uh, what is it the the uh, the scapegoat or some of the different sacrifices that were done outside of the city right which as an offering for sin as an offering for sin okay right so it is very specifically because you could also use a sacrifice to ask for anything in the Old Testament, and there was various ranges of sacrifices that would be offered for this or for that reason and what have you. But uh, certain sin offering sacrifices, um, like the scapegoating, you know, sacrifice, for example, that that all had to be done outside the gate. And uh, as you just mentioned, so um, so that's actually an important thing laying this down. And lastly, is the concept of the purpose. It's the it's the proximate and principal purpose for Christ's death to appease God in regard to the human race, which is the, you know the purpose of a true sacrifice, making peace through the blood of the cross, etc. As Saint Paul says. And all the scriptures proclaim the same thing. So he shows there that, um, you know, Christ's sacrifice is, in fact, a true sacrifice. And it, uh, you know, it's different from those that that's eaten. Because, again, the martyr's sacrifices would be these improper sacrifices, not proper ones. And he says that the, the, the end, of the purpose of the martyr sacrifice is in the very name martyr in Greek, which right. means witness. The, the, that's, right. that's the primary end of what they're doing is to witness to Christ. And, of course, none of the martyrs themselves um, could make... A peace with between the whole human race and God. <laughs> None of them had that right. capacity to do. So then, uh, you know, the, and then the next question from there, of course, is, you know, finishing up, uh, you know, is the cross a true sacrifice? 
is is the mass sacrifice. And so he's so he's hitherto laid down, you know, what a true sacrifice is, why what the his Protestant uh, objectors argue is a sacrifice doesn't satisfy the matter from the Old Testament, as well as from Hebrews, by the way, you know, where St. Paul says every priest has something which he must offer, right? Yeah. And so when he comes and he brings this back in the questions that follow as the mass of sacrifice, and that's going to be, you know, demonstrated through these Old Testament types, that the mass, yes, the mass truly is a sacrifice, because you have all of these same things that he's described previously in the Mass. And then he goes forward to give, you know, his proofs of it by examining the types of the Old Testament. And 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 he actually spends a lot of time on, uh, on going through different types, correct? That's right. So the yeah. first one he does is Melchizedek, and that's a very lengthy chapter. So, but the essence there is that he takes on the Protestant arguments that, no, 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 Melchizedek didn't offer anything. All he did was come in and he, you know, he had bread and wine for the refreshment of, of Abraham and his men. So, but then Bellarmine takes that apart based on the, the words of Scripture itself, which say that he was a priest of the Most High God, um, and he brought out bread for sacrifice. That these two, you know, concepts are joined linguistically in the Hebrew, and he shows it with the Hebrew exegesis, showing that these words they they go together. And so Melchizedek did in fact offer bread and wine, right? He took it out to, in order, he, you know, advanced bread and wine to have uh, ready to offer to God. And then after, of course, he is, we don't deny that he gave it to, to be consumed by Abraham and his men, but not as mere refreshment. First, it was offered and dedicated to God. So he's, so, so the, the language of sacrifice is explicitly used in the Hebrew of, what is it, Genesis uh, 18? Is that where we are? And in Melchizedek, wherever, but uh, there's right. there's a... uh, um, yes, and so and on top of that, uh, he cites uh, the Hebrew words that are present for you know taking out bread and wine are used to describe sacrifices in other places of the Old Testament, and like in Genesis, uh, um, let's see, uh, thirty twenty seven and other places, you know, he mentions how. You know, this word is used, it's used again, you know, it, it, it has been used to mean sacrifice before, so why not here? Is there any reason why not here when he's a priest of the Most High God? Yeah. And then he goes later, you know, you're a priest according to Melchizedek um, in, in Psalm 109. You're a priest forever according to the word of Melchizedek. But if he has nothing to offer, how can Melchizedek truly be a priest? As it says in Hebrews, every priest has something for which he is to offer. What's the sacrifice of Melchizedek except bread and wine? So the, Melch you know, the sacrifice of Melchizedek brought out into the New Testament is the bread and wine that is transformed into Christ's body and blood. Now, you have to keep in mind, too, at the point in which this treatise shows up in the controversies, he's already done four books defending the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Okay. And so, and all the different scholastic elements that make up the theology of the Eucharist. So he's not taking these things up again because at this point, you know, where to get in the treatise, you know, he already considers it as proven. And so it, it's uh, so that's why he doesn't take the time to make that argument here because he's already done. I just haven't translated it yet. So, so Saint Paul goes at great length in the Epistles to the Hebrews to connect the priesthood of Christ to the priesthood of Melchizedek. That it's that it's right. a, it's a it's a new priesthood. It's a better priesthood. It's superior to the priesthood of Moses. It's superior to the priesthood of of the of the the uh, of Aaron of the Old Testament. And um, it's a better covenant with a better priesthood. It's St. Paul's sort of the, the Christian chest beating again, <laughs> uh, in comparison to the old covenant. Right. But, uh, you know, this is the this is the supersessionism that they attack us for. Um, right. But uh, but it, but in making this argument, he's appe he's actually going back into the Old Testament, talking about Melchizedek and sort of exegeting that passage. And also. What, what, what's fascinating is, I mean, it's dawning on me as I'm listening to you say this, he's saying what St. Paul says in Hebrews about the priesthood, that, that, that a priest has to have something to offer, and he's using that to refute the Protestants who said, well, Melchizedek just basically shut up with sandwiches uh, after this fight and said, here, guys, eat. You must be hungry. You just won a war. Um, but no, he actually, he was a priest of the Most High God, as Genesis says, and St. Paul says that priests have to have something to offer. And you put priesthood and sacrifice together, which always go together in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and there you go. It's a sacrifice. Plus, it's using Hebrew language for sacrifice. 
Right. And so, and on top of that, uh, as he's going through uh, the 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 ancient fathers, how the fathers of the church, both the Greek and the Latin fathers, uh, all understand that Melchizedek offered bread and wine and sacrifice. Right? That's what they all understand. And there's there's really no one among the fathers that thinks otherwise. Right? That, that's recorded at least. And so then after he's done noting that, the, the long list of the Greek and Latin fathers, he comes to the fact that the ancient rabbis also believe the exact same thing. So he quotes the Bereshit Rabbah, which is part of the Midrash, and which has commentaries on, on uh, Genesis. And, among, and, and this is true, by the way, that modern scholars understand these, book, the, these commentaries are authentic. And so among others contained there, there are the words of Rabbi Samuel, in chapter 14 of Genesis, where he hands down the acts, of, where he says, quote, he hands down the acts of priesthood, for he sacrificed bread and wine to the holy and blessed God, unquote. And he adds another rabbi, rabbinical commentator who says in Numbers 28, in the time of the Messiah, the Messiah, all the sacrifices will cease, except for the sacrifice of bread and wine, that is the huh. Todah, which Amazing. means thanks, and hence Eucharistasis, thanksgiving, right? So he will offer the sacrifice of bread and wine. It will not cease, for it was said thus in Genesis fourteen eighteen. I mean, that, that's the gloss of the commentator, by the way, because they, they didn't have that explicit notation that way in the Midrash. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. For Melchizedek, that is the Messiah king, will begin from the cessation of the sacrifices, the sacrifice of bread and wine, just as it is in in, in, in the Psalms, etc. That's actually shocking that a, that a, that a rabbinical... Uh, authority right. would say this. Pre-Christian, uh, before the first century. So he's actually, it's, it would seem to me that he's got Jeremiah's thirty-one, thirty-one in mind, that there's yes. going to be a new covenant, which is not going to be like the covenant I made with your fathers. And there's going to be a new sacrifice as part of this, and it's going to be a perpetual Todah offering of Thanksgiving. Wow. That's amazing. I'd never even heard of that one before. Um. So, okay, keep going, Ryan. I'm sorry, I cut in okay, there. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, so anyway, so it, it, it's we could I mean we could continue on the Melchizedek bit. So, but it's uh, it's fairly explicit. I mean, when you get done with that, I really don't see a good argument against that. Um, although I'd have to check some of the works of later Protestants to Bellarmine, like Gerhard and others, to see what they say on it. But he moves from there to prove the sacrifice of the mass from the figure of the Paschal Lamb. So here. Um, the celebration of the Paschal Lamb was an express figure of the celebration of the Eucharist. Yet that was a certain immolation of the victim offered to God. So the celebration of the Eucharist ought to be an immolation of a victim offered to God, that the figure would correspond to what's been prefigured. Um, and so, of course, the Protestants deny the, the whole proposition. Um, so he goes on you know, to set it out you know, from the figure in the Old Testament. And... So the Pasch that's immolated, obviously, uh, St. Paul talks about Christ, our Pasch, has yes. been immolated, so let us feast on the unleavened bread of sincerity and, and truth. truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Bellarmine adds, from this passage, we can constitute for certain that the Paschal Lamb, which is called the Pasch in the Gospel, was a figure of the immolation of Christ. When, however, it was fulfilled, cannot be constituted as certainly from that passage alone. And then he goes on various arguments from the Protestants and whatnot. And so he goes to prove, you know, principally when that was fulfilled, and he says it's at the Last Supper. Okay. Yeah, which was when the Paschal lambs were being offered, right? I mean, so right. it's the whole thing. I mean, that, that scene in the garden, I, I've read that uh, when our Lord is suffering his agony in the garden, there was blood. There was blood coming down from the temple into the, into the torrent of Kedron because mm -hmm. of all of the thousands of lambs that were being sacrificed in the temple on that day. So it's so fitting uh, that that type would be so perfectly fulfilled in the man that St. John the Baptist pointed out as the Lamb of God, right? Right. Uh, you're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. Uh, we're talking about the Mass as a True Sacrifice with our guest, Ryan Grant, the founder and president of Mediatrix Press, who's just recently published a book on the Most Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. By the way, Ryan, if people want to get that book, they go to mediatrixpress.com, right? Isn't that where it's for sale? That's right. So it'll be present on the sidebar, um, and it will also be on Amazon as well if you want to get it there, and that's where you can ob obtain the Kindle. So I've got, I, I'm also going to have a link to it on, on the reconquest.net page. I'm just going to link right to your 
your page uh, and encourage people not to buy from Amazon, but from yes, from you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nevertheless, um, just for the the access and yeah, it's in all these places. But. Yeah, no, I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, okay, so g- going back to um, the the uh, okay, so we have the typological arguments, and those are fascinating. But he also he, he also what I like to do is I like to c- touch on a couple of maybe Old Testament or maybe one Old Testament, one New Testament. arguments argument. And then sure. I, I want to talk about the essence of the mass too, before we conclude, right. because if we, if we don't say that we've lost, I think we, we, would, we would have lost something because he has a lot to say on what constitutes the actual essence of the mass as a sacrifice. So what, 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 what are like, say one old Testament, he uses a lot of scriptural arguments, a whole chapter on, on some of these passages. What's one Old Testament and one New Testament uh, argument that St. Robert Bellarmine uses to show the true sacrificial nature of the Mass? Well, the, uh, um, he goes into what the prophets had foretold, and most especially that of Malachi. And so Malachi or Malachi, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, I'm actually not sure what the correct Hebrew is, but anyway, um, as he goes through taking in, you know, and the verse actually I think is pretty clear. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not receive a gift of your hand, for from the rising of the sun, even to the setting, my name is great among the Gentiles, the Goyim in the, in the Hebrew, mm-hmm. and in every place there is offered to my name a clean oblation, for my, my name is great among the Gentiles, says the Lord of hosts. Unquote. So that's uh, <clears throat> Malachi. And so Bellarmine adds on, now this testimony cannot be understood on the sacrifice of the cross. He means the explicit uh, historical actual sacrifice of the cross that only happened once and for all. Mm-hmm. Um, rather, so he says, you know, it can't be understood uh, in regard to the sacrifice of the cross because that was not offered in every place, but only in one place. Nor in some Jewish sacrifice, because the prophet says it was going to be offered by the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. And clearly that's opposed to the sacrifices of the, of the Hebrews. It is also not speaking about the sacrifices of the pious Gentiles who were in the world before the arrival of Christ, such as Melchizedek, Job, and others like them. For these holy men were very few among the nations, and especially in the times of the prophets when idolatry clearly filled the whole world. So that David said, <clears throat> God is known in Judea, and Israel, in Israel his name is great. But Malachi gives a prophecy in a contrary manner, in verse 11. My name is great among the Gentiles, and from the rising of the sun to its setting, etc. Again, the passage of Malachi cannot be understood, as some suppose, on the sacrifices of idolaters among the Gentiles. For that oblation was not clean in any way, nor offered to the true God, but to foreign gods. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, as it is in Scripture. So what is this sacrifice, Bellarmine asks, if it's not of the Jews, and it's not of the handful of righteous Gentiles like Job, etc., and it's not you know, of the, of the heathen, you know, what's it going to be? It's prefiguring the future sacrifice of the New Testament, which will be offered mostly by Gentiles, as it will turn out, and... In, in uh, from from east to west, rising right. the setting. Now, it's 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 not talking about the time of day. It's talking about the, right. the globe. The the okay, east and west. Yeah. yeah. So I so when I I translated the scripture there, uh, I translated it literally because the conventions of all the the older translations of scripture follow it. But what that rising of the sun to the setting actually means is east to west. In Latin, for example, as well as in other languages, and as well as in Hebrew. The word oriens means, you know, for east, actually it literally means rising. Yeah. And the ochidens literally means setting, which is the west, because the sun goes down over there, the sun comes up over here, so we're just going to call it by what we see. That's uh-huh. essentially how it worked, and then it gets passed down. Yeah, that's the oriens, and that's the ochidens, and you just know it that way. So, it, you know, so that was literally translated by the original Dewey translators, and it was followed up by the King James, etc. We can go on that tangent uh, another time. So, but yeah, but it's the east and the west, it, you know, is what it means. All over, everywhere, this sacrifice will be offered, continually. And there was no such thing. Uh, if, if we're not talking about the Mass, that prophecy simply wasn't fulfilled. Right, because any offering to any pagan god is not a clean offering. 
because Scripture identifies the gods of the nations as demons, not just the Old Testament, whereas a lot of people like to write that off and say, oh, well, yeah, that was just, that was just the Jews, you know, and how they looked at it. No, St. Paul says the very same thing in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So, you know, about the, you know, um, the sacrifices of the, of the nations, you know, and he's to speaking specifically of the Greeks and the Romans. So it, it's the, they're keeping up that very same understanding. And of course, the fathers of the church understood this passage to mean just that, right. correct? I mean, the Precisely. Eastern fathers... And he gives the... copious patristic testimony, again, citing that uh, Malachi's talking explicitly about, you know, the, the, the future coming of the Mass, basically. And that's that's how the fathers all understood it. So it's um, it, it's one of the actually in my favorite chapters in the book. And he also shows that the Hebrew words in in again are used for sacrifice all over the the Hebrew Old Testament. So if we're going to go to a New Testament, there's a lot of them, and they're very good. But um, my very favorite one, because this floored me when I read it, and I wasn't expecting this one is uh, the cha in chapter 11 of book 1. The sacrifice of the Mass is proven from John chapter 4. So he takes this one, uh, the hour, when he's speaking to the woman at the well of oh, Samaria. Yeah, the Samaritan hour, woman, okay. Yeah, the hour comes when you shall adore the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And again in verse 23, Christ says, the hour comes and now is when the true adorers shall adore the Father in spirit and in truth. Unquote. For in this passage, not any prayer you like is understood by adoration, but the solemn and public prayer through sacrifice, properly speaking. We shall prove it with three arguments. In, in, and so first he goes to show that it was not unusual in Scripture to, to uh, speak of sacrifice by the, the word adoration. So he shows this in the Old Testament again by recourse to the Hebrew as a, as a way of prefacing it. Um, and then he goes on to explain it. Um, I missed the spot. Anyway, yes, yeah, so we're so we moving to the arguments. So the first argument, the words of the Lord, true adorers shall adore the Father in spirit and truth, must be understood on sacrifice. And that is deduced from the principal scope of the whole passage, he says. This is Bellarmine. The Samaritan woman proposed the question for the Lord in regard to the schism of the Jews and the Samaritans. Master, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers adored on this mountain, and you say that Jerusalem is the place where it is right to give adoration. This question must necessarily be understood on adoration through sacrifice. Because they're talking um, about two different temples, right? They're talking about the Temple right. of Jerusalem and the Temple on, on Mount um, uh, Sikar, right? That the S right. Samaritans uh, Ger Gerizim. Gerizim, and, thank you. Sikar, I guess, then, was the city. On my, on Mount Gerizim was the mountain. And so for Gerizim, you know, and so the Jews, according to Josephus and other authorities he cites, they, the, the Samaritans wanted to be able to offer sacrifice at Mount Gerizim. But the Jews said, no, it can only be done in Jerusalem. And that's the kind of the source of the schism. And then Bellarmine adds, the words of the Samaritan woman compel us to understand sacrifice in the word adoration. For she speaks about adoration bound to a certain place, uh -huh. which otherwise could not be done with due observance. But if the matter so stands, it is necessary that even the Lord's response on adoration be understood by sacrifice. Otherwise, the Lord would not satisfy the question that was proposed. So when the Lord says, woman, believe me that the hour comes when you shall not adore the Father either on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, the sense of that is the time will come when adoration through sacrifice will not be bound to this mountain or Jerusalem, but in every place sacrifice shall be offered to the Lord. Right, and which is namely the very thing Malachi foretold. Mm -hmm. In every place, a clean oblation is offered to my name. Wow, that that is fascinating because, of course, that's a passage that the Protestants often use against us, and they say, "Well, it's right. not the sacrifice thing; it's adoration in spirit and in truth." So you get this sort of, you know, angelic thing where it's you know it's it, it's not bodily, it's not corporeal, it's not an external sacrifice. It's just this; it's either hymning or singing or or just you know, if you're a Quaker, it's the, the ultimate and sort of strictly internal type religion amazing that that he actually takes that whole argument and turns it on its head it, it's uh, i'm not sure if they made that argument because he doesn't cite anyone specifically that might be a later addressing of the argument but still i'd never heard that before before right. i read this book and i was just kind of blown away by that it's just wow and uh, he cites various fathers on the same point and it's so, not, so you know, he, it's not so something he, newfangled he's coming up with so he had patristic uh, uh he had patristic arguments for how john 4 
proves the sacrificial nature of the mass, that that adoration that he speaks to, speaks of to the Samaritan woman is specifically sacrificial in nature. Right. Cool. That's impressive. Um, you know, I, Ryan, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the, the, the essence of the Mass, you know, in, in, in what is the Mass truly a sacrifice. But we're going to have to save that for some other time. Cause oh, we, boy. <laughs> we got, yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? So I, I, we, I need to have you back so we can talk about ex- and exactly what does the sacrificial character of the Mass consist. And then maybe we could talk about some of the other th- things regarding um, the, the uh, how he ahead of time gave us great apologetics against the Novus Ordo, <laughs> which is right. all in the.